Hi, this is Larkin Seipel, and you are listening to Cinepod, the cinematography podcast. The following podcast contains explicit language. You're listening to the Cinematography Podcast presented by Hot Rod Cameras, a program about the art, craft and philosophy of the moving image and the people who make it happen. Coming to you from the world headquarters of Hot Rod Cameras in Hollywood, California, are your hosts, Ben Rock and Ilya Friedman. Hey, Ilya, how you doing? I'm doing all right. How about yourself? I'm doing great. We have a personal favorite, Larkin Seipel, returning this week. What could be bad about that? Nothing at all. It's a great conversation, and we'll get into it in just a moment. But before we do, who are you and what do you do? Oh, hi. I'm director Ben Rock. I'm a Taurus. Long walks on the beach? No. Yeah, yeah. You can find out all about me at benrock.com. How about yourself? Who are you? Let's let the listeners know who you are again. Hey, I am uh, Ilya Friedman. I've got a company called Hot Rad Cameras. I uh, used to be a cinematographer, a camera assistant operator, worked for a camera manufacturer, worked on the team that invented the 4K digital cinema thing way back when. And today, Hot Rad Cameras, that's my company. And uh, we sell all manner of cameras and lighting and lenses and and you name it to the motion picture and television industry and uh, students and corporations and people all over the planet. So before we get into the show, I wanted to touch base with one of our listeners who we've had a couple of pieces of viewer mail from, viewer, listener mail from. Oh, uh, who's that? Our friend Josh Clutterbuck, who uh, oh. years ago came to us with kind of a dilemmas about going to film school, and we chatted with him a little bit, and we've uh, talked about him a little bit on the show, and he sent me a message on Instagram the other day after my rant, rant about Final Cut yeah. Pro 10 on the rant iPad. Rant is fair. You, you can't really mention Final Cut without ranting. So That's yeah, true. Ran, yeah, well, rant is it, right. it's the ranting of a jilted lover. I was, I, uh, Final Cut Pro was my was my jam, and then they ruined it. So it's hard for me to, it, you know, once bitten, twice shy here. So, but yeah. anyway, I would like to read to you what Josh said to me. Hey, Ben, mm. I heard you guys talking about the video editing from iPad with Final Cut, but I just wanted to say I love editing on my iPad. Nothing export quality, but it's been a great asset to have on set. I've used Pinnacle Studios and it's not bad. I use the video edits on iPad for dailies and will be using Final Cut in the same way. Using USB-C hard drive with my iPad is so good too. Can wrangle data on uh, editor's computer and then I can take a copy as director producer and show a client or the crew the next day. Anyway, I'll send another message as I start to use Final Cut more on our TV studio work in the coming months. I just know you guys were talking about who would use this and how, and so far the programs that uh, have been available have been crap. But as a student with limited crew, iPad editing as a rush has been great. And I think wow. it, it's a very interesting take on it because I do think that there is a need for having a simple portable editing solution on set or that you can kind of run around with a little bit. And uh, I know it's silly, but a laptop is maybe just clunky enough to be lugging around when you're doing all this other stuff. And an iPad is like walking around with a clipboard. So and, I can, and, you know, I, I got to imagine it's got to be, you know, touch and drag. So real easy, like unlike having to use like a touchpad, you're not actually like just poking the screen on a laptop. So with the iPad, it's going to be like, oh, put this foot shot here, put this shot here. Maybe it is really fast. Maybe it is a, a good way to go. I don't know. Yeah, but I, uh, that's awesome that Josh reached out. I, I hope that he does uh, update us. I'd, well, I'd like he, to... he even said, uh, we'll, we'll take him up on this, if, uh, but that he might record a voice memo outlining his experience using it. I, like him, have experimented uh, less successfully, though, less successfully than Josh, with using iPad-based editing. And having a USB-C converter for your drives and stuff like that, to me, makes the rig just clunky enough that I would just as soon use uh, a laptop, which is going to be a more powerful system for editing. And I've edited on laptops for years, so maybe I'm just more comfortable with that. Who knows? Anyway, thank you, Josh. And I hope people can find good use for it. It seems like a good idea. I mean, the idea to me would be that you could maybe jam together a rough assembly on set, export an XML to your editor, or have your editor on set doing that, export an XML, open it up in real Final Cut Pro 10 or Premiere or Avid or Resolve and keep on trucking. So like if Final Cut Pro 10 became like an onset staging place for quick and dirty cuts that could then ease into the workflow of the overall film, I think that that's a win. And now, Close Focus. 
What do we have to talk about for a close focus today? What what's going on in the world? Well, it's theatrical. We're here to talk about movies. We talked to a lot of filmmakers, and this past weekend was a holiday weekend. It was Juneteenth, so it was a three-day weekend. And The Flash, which is Warner Brothers, you know, I, I'd say it's like the last sputter of the Snyderverse, sort of. But mm. also, I haven't seen it yet, so I'm not here to say anything negative about it or positive. I haven't seen it. It looks cool, but I also feel like they're casting a line in the water for our generation by bringing Michael Keaton back to play Batman in an alternate universe, which sounds cool. Anyway, it made $55 million. They were sort of estimating that it needed to make 70 to be considered an okay success. I believe Black Adam, which is considered to be kind of a bomb from DC mm. and Warner Brothers, Black Adam, I think, made $65 million on its opening weekend, and it didn't get any better. And then Pixar had yeah. uh, released Elemental, which I have seen and is actually a really good film. Like I, I, Pixar, to me, has never really made a bad film. It's no um, Cars 3, though. Come on. I'm sorry. I haven't <laughs> seen Cars 3. I was just <laughs> Uh, in all honesty, I have not seen Cars 3, but I have seen Cars 1 and Cars 2. And my son's way into Cars, so Cars 3 can't be far. But I, I have seen most of what Pixar has done. And there are movies that I like more than others, but they're brilliant. Like, they're really brilliant. And I think Elemental is a pretty awesome film. And it made uh, what is considered to be... 29. Kind of a, uh, yeah, yeah, 29 a, and a half million. A, yeah. hu a huge disappointment for Pixar. And so, uh, you know, these are like $200 million movies. So the question is, is theatrical not as back as we thought it was? One of my theories is, have people just gotten so used to, during the pandemic, just gotten so used to not going to the movie theaters that they need a little bit more of an incentive to go to the movie theaters? Also, these two movies in particular have different marketing challenges. One is that the lead actor in The Flash is Ezra Miller, and they have been an extraordinarily problematic person to market. Uh, you can look it up. I don't need to get into it. But super gross allegations of super gross, awful behavior that is not acceptable. But also, and, and this is a serious thing that I think, the Writers Guild strike has stopped all late night talk shows. Now, am I just an old man thinking that if you go on The Tonight Show or Colbert or Seth Meyers or any of these things, like Michael Keaton going on these shows would make me very much want to go see a movie or at least raise my awareness of it. And he's charming and funny and cool. And he's like a perfect brand ambassador for this kind of a thing is not having those kinds of shows at all. Uh, dinging the box office because I do feel like that's a big driver of it even if people aren't watching it when it airs if they're watching it on YouTube which honestly that's where I probably watch the most of that stuff uh, d what do you think maybe I, I think I would need a little bit more data, a little bit more evidence. Like as you were chatting just now about the uh, late night lack of um, you know uh, your lack marketing. of Kimmel. Yeah, the, the marketing PR. I just want to do a real quick bit of research. And so I did a quick Google of. Um, so you know, what you're what saying was, is you weren't listening to a word I said. Go on. Uh, I was half listening. That's uh, as you were talking here, I was just reading this. I was curious in 2019 what the Father's Day weekend looked like at the box office and what was the winner and how much money did it make? Because I feel like some things are cyclical. And so I was kind of curious between like the box office now and the box office then. Men in Black International opened in the top spot in the U.S. and Canada. Interesting. Uh, and the film only brought in $28.5 million. It could be that there were many more choices, and so maybe there's fewer choices now. But the fact that Elemental made 30 and The Flash made 55 doesn't sound so bad to me when I jump back to 2019 and see and you're, that. And you're it, saying before the pandemic. So you're saying before pre, the pandemic. Pre-pandemic exactly. numbers. And even though movie ticket prices have gone up a little bit, it, it wouldn't be a factor of three <laughs> that it would be lower, you know? Exactly. So I don't know. I think that there is something to be said about like, you know, historical times because Christmas was always like, you know, it was a big thing. But certain other weekends, Memorial Day weekend, there are other, certain weekends were like big weekends and other ones were, were hmm. less so. And I'm kind of wondering if fathers, you know, across the country just weren't really feeling the flash or uh, elemental. I'm wondering if like maybe it was Father's Day. So it was up well, to them of what they so went to go I wanna, see. I so. want to bring one other yeah. thing up with elemental, which, again, I will say is excellent. Mm. I think elemental does what Pixar does best. It tells a great story. It's got solid characters. It knows how to tug your heartstrings. And visually, it's just amazing. But there really isn't one big name actor in it. The closest is Catherine O'Hara, who has kind hmm. of a supporting part. Yeah, interesting. 
I remember going to see the first Toy Story and it's like, oh yeah, it's this thing with Tom Hanks and Tim Allen. The name picks, I wonder if the bet was that the name Pixar alone would bring people in and it doesn't matter. And truthfully, as a work of drama, it doesn't matter. But if you had, you know, I don't know who would be the right person. If Mindy Kaling had been the female lead in this, you would have somebody who had a big social media imprint who, again, could theoretically get on late night talk shows if they were happening at the moment, like somebody who could go out and kind of be the brand ambassador for the film. And all the actors in the movie are people who've worked a lot, but neither of the two leads who are both excellent are movie stars. And gotcha. that plus there really are, isn't the talk show blah, blah, blah circuit to go on. You maybe could take someone who was lesser known and put them on Colbert and Kimmel and Seth Meyers and whatnot and raise awareness. But without those outlets, how do you even get the word out about it outside of just traditional advertising and hoping that the trailer for the movie is the thing that brings people in? So I'm interested to see as we slog through the summer if... These two movies might not be specific cases to be looked at. You know what I mean? Yeah, it will be interesting to watch. I don't really know which way it's going to go. I mean, what's coming up next? I'll, I'll tell you right now. Let's see. Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny, June 30th. I mean, that's got a lot going for it besides just, you know, the star power. Oh, and, and Mission actually... Mission Impossible, <laughs> July so the, 12th. Actually, and I don't know if you've heard about this, but there's like a kerfuffle about Mission Impossible and the new Christopher Nolan movie, Oppenheimer. Yeah. And that's that Oppenheimer scooped up every IMAX screen in the entire country for three weeks and got a commitment. And Mission Impossible can't get any IMAX screens. And so Tom Cruise has been going supposedly full Tom Cruise. He's jumping uh, on the couch. Like, yeah, yeah. But like pushing the theaters and the exhibitors and stuff to kind of let them squeak in because everything I've seen about the new Mission Impossible movie, it looks like some pretty impressive spectacle that probably would be awesome in IMAX. Uh, I, yeah, I, I don't know I don't, what's going to happen. We'll, we'll find out if it's going to be a, a slog at the box office or people are going to, I don't know, get their movie trailers from Twitter. Who knows what's going to happen? We'll, we'll see. I guess we'll see. Well, let's go ahead and get into the interview with Larkin Seipel. Let's do it. The Cinematography Podcast Interview. Joining me now is Larkin Seipel, uh, returning to the Cinematography Podcast. Thanks so much for coming back to talk to us about your new show, Beef. Yeah, thanks for having me back. It's uh, exciting to chat about it. Uh, But before we get into Beef, I have to ask you one question. One question that is not necessarily related to Beef. You were nominated for an Emmy for Gaslit. Everything, everywhere, won Best Picture. You shot the Best Picture Oscar winner, has your life changed at all? Has, has, have, has, do you get more calls now? <laughs> has anything changed in what you know your your professional career since since any of this has happened? Um, can't I can't really tell in terms of the uh, are people like you know knocking down your door and getting all these crazy offers? In general, I, I've tended to always just work with friends mm-hmm. on projects, and that's always been my priority. Yeah. So beef coming up. I knew Jake Schreier, who was a friend, and. I kind of followed that rhythm of it, but no, nothing, sadly, nothing has really changed for me. I don't think I can't tell who knows, but um, my, my friends think things have changed for the Daniels for sure. <laughs> oh, oh, for sure. For sure. I, I asked this question actually of a lot of cinematographers who uh, are on the show and your answer is actually pretty much right in line with everyone. I think it makes a huge difference when you are the director or a star of something that, that wins, uh, wins the grand prize at the Oscars, but uh, cinematographers and other people are like, yeah, maybe I get one extra call, two extra calls. They, they do, usually don't tell me that like, you know, their whole life completely is it's like takes off like on a rocket af- after that. But uh, I have to say that everyone who I've, I've talked to about this say your calls definitely get answered a lot more. So when you're calling out to people, it seems like you know, the, yeah. the, the phone gets picked up, which I got to say is probably a nice thing. If you want to reach out to someone, you want to connect with someone, you, you ha- now have this pedigree behind you of the awards and uh, whatnot of being associated with these projects. I expect that you're uh, going to get a lot, a lot more interesting stuff and you're probably going to have a lot more friends doing uh, cool stuff here going on in the future. So, <laughs> so, so yeah, it, I, I'm delighted that this has happened for you and I can't wait to see where it goes. So, hey, let's get into beef. Beef is... Uh, sure. Beef is a lot of fun, and it's also very different. I hesitate to use the word anti-heroes, but uh, there aren't any heroes in this. Everyone is a, an anti-hero or a villain or some other uh, non-traditional leading character. How would you describe Beef to people who are going into it who know nothing about it? 
<laughs> uh, well, I know it's hard, it's hard to describe in that without obviously giving it away and know nothing about it. For me, the fun part is I honestly do think that Danny and Amy are villains and that they are the people that make choices that ruin other people's lives. But also it's about that range of selfishness. Sure. And that's to me what defines a villain is someone who is so selfish that they will do things, do terrible things to get their needs. And the thing is, though, is you can still love that person or understand that person. And to me, this movie is about empathy and about understanding the truly terrible people out there because I, I love the characters of Danny and Amy in the show and they do terrible things, but it's not like they like stayed up late in the lab at night and like were concocting like a doomsday device. They just, you know, made the wrong choice at the wrong time or they like got too excited about something. It's just, but the show is, is more than that. It's layered about the idea of like what it means to be kind of happy. And is that possible? I, I think that is the the best description I've heard of the, the show yet. Uh, I was going to say that uh, it seems like layers of villainy or antiheroes, because as it goes on, you start to realize the depth of certain characters and what extremes they're willing to go to. And I think by the time uh, the character of Isaac is introduced, you're not, you know, he he's someone who's served time. He's, you know, he's, he's out of jail and you don't really understand, like, really what he's capable of and how dark and how everything goes until as the show moves on. Okay, so you've got a cast of characters. Each one of them has some degree of empathy for, you know, their fellow human being. But for the most part, there is a lot of uh, there's a lot of anger and there's a lot of one upsmanship that, that goes on. How do you approach the visual storytelling for this? I assume that you had a, probably a lot of conversations with the, uh, the, the showrunners and directors about crafting this look. But what is the overarching theme because you're dealing with all of these sorts of characters here. I assume that there must be something that, that you, there's some way that you really want to showcase people being in their worlds or being in their headspace or being in their, their reality. How do you approach that? The characters in the show make some very terrible and selfish decisions almost every episode. And to make that effective and to make the audience understand that, we opted to make the camera more manipulative of the audience's concept of what's happening. So we, we kept the cameras very close to the main characters and we used wider lenses to bring you into their sphere. And then everything else, we kind of backed away. We shot it over their shoulder and we minimized coverage so that as you're watching it and things are unfolding, it's, you're kind of stuck with these, you know, anti-heroes perspectives. So you're going to naturally side with them and feel for them, even when they make terrible ideas. And our camera, the other trick was we also never wanted to have the camera judge our villains, if you will in a way and so you it's we never get too abstract with the framing and we also never get too removed like we never step back too far we basically wanted to be very subjective and we also wanted to um avoid the coverage fest that can become a lot of dramas where it's just like five cameras shooting handheld or something and so we opted to minimize the coverage and see how much of the performance we could hold in one take or in one angle and if we could evolve the shot you know and see how long we can make the scene last. Like if it's a tight on Danny and then he walks forward and the camera pans into an over on the person he's talking to, you know, now you've gotten two angles out of one shot. You don't need to cut. And the show is, I mean, we do cut around, but you know, I think a lot of good directors and showrunners understand that the idea that every time you cut, you're telling the audience it's a lie. And so the, like the least amount of cutting you can do, the better. And we started there, we started very simply and we started picking apart the scenes and sequences and we just tried to kind of i think everyone creates like a like a base layer of truth which is like if we do these certain things the audience will believe it and so our, our idea was to never get showy or glossy and just kind of keep the cameras with the characters just like the first chase sequence we tried to very much stay with danny you know and didn't have a freaking drone shot countering him down the freeway and like crazy car mounts and things like that we really wanted to just make it you know initially it was all going to be like a one shot from inside the truck mm. just as pov mm -hmm. and then we kind of figured out we needed more pieces for the audience to understand the full range of destruction that danny causes um but yeah we tried to keep it simple and then expand upon it it's a really dynamic opening to the show, too. Not speaking necessarily of the, of the return sequence, but the moment he gets into the car, the moment he gets into that car, there's there, there's a couple minutes of that that cheese scene that is like it's nail biting white knuckle. And it's not totally out of the look of the rest of the show. But I will say that there's never a time that it feels just like that sort of this frenetic introduction. 
Can you talk a little bit more about that that chase sequence at the beginning, like how that came to be and how you decided that uh, that's the way that you really wanted to cover it? Because it's it's really a lot of fun. I mean, it, it feels like French Connection in, in moments in there. Um, well, we again, we wanted to, to kind of strip everything down. So originally it was like, we're going to be a close on Danny and then just as POV looking out the windshield as he's chasing this car. And as we kind of reviewed it, we realized we're losing the danger. You know, you, some of these things, these near misses, these dodges, these him going through the intersection, you can't see it if it's just a perspective. So we opted to then be like, well, what if we just, we'll push and pull him, but we'll never be far away from him. We'll just be like on his bumper or on his taillight. Um, you know, we're never with Amy or the white car. And so we started to design like a snake pattern through traffic. And then that big intersection sequence where the hibachi grill falls out the back of the truck was written. And we were like, well, how do we do that? And then I think on the first take, I think there's actually a stunty in the back that kicked the hibachi grill for us. He mm-hmm. kicks it and it launches and smashes into the lens. Yeah. And then after we shot it, it's great. It was by accident. And, you know, they were getting ready to do another take. And I was like, I don't think we should do it again, guys. I think we don't think it's going to get better than that. I like, guess it's impossible. And then we did another take and it wasn't as good and we moved on. But the chase worked really well. We were so stressed about it that we overprepared and I think we wrapped early. Mm. Like we literally were like ran out of things to do wow. because we didn't want to do too many. That whole street we had to kind of, it's like a remote industrial area and Grace, our production designer, had to bring in stop signs and actually the stop light and add it to that whole area because no one would let us kind of weave through traffic in Los Angeles unless it was like a barren industrial area. It sounds about right. Yeah. LA notoriously fun for trying to make things like that happen. Anyway, I love that hibachi moment and it really does. It looks like it completely fills the frame and smacks right in front of the lens. And, and at first when I saw that, I thought, oh, this must have been CG. This must have been some sort of CG because how do you get <laughs> that to hit to, to land right like that? Now, was anything destroyed when that happened? Because it looked like, you know, it looked like it was the real deal. It looked like a Hibachi fell out of the back of a truck and then the camera smashes right into it. So uh, well, I, we weren't planning on it. Like we were like, oh, shit. <laughs> um, and the driver of the chase arm or chase car just, you know, hit the brakes. But I was like, <laughs> as we were doing it, I was like, is he trying to hit it? Like, is he <laughs> slowing down just enough to let it hit? I couldn't tell. Um, and we didn't. The camera was fine. Oh, that's God. great. But oh. it, it does. It hits it perfectly. And I, I was very excited. I was like, it worked. And I never, never thought that would ever happen. Oh, it, it, the, 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 the film gods had aligned at that moment and they were smiling on you because it looks so intentional. It looks like that's the way it was storyboarded. It looks it, it looks fantastic. OK, <laughs> hey, uh, I, I want to talk a little bit about interior Danny's apartment. There's a lot of this this show that takes place inside the apartment. And there's a lot of like Danny brooding in darkness and lots of different angles and camera movements of him, you know, moving around this this sort of dark apartment. It looks like a real location, but you have so much movement and stuff. It made me think, is this a set? Is this on location? How are you devising all this stuff? Is it really like a, you know, an apartment in the valley somewhere? Is it, what's the thought for Danny's apartment or, or Danny and uh, Paul's apartment? It's a set. It was mm. a set. And it's a set that I love because it reminds me very much of my apartment or my, my first apartment in Los Angeles, like identical to it, to the vertical blinds and that same kind of like popcorn ceiling and the stucco everywhere and even the stairs and around the complex that was one of my it was one of my favorite things because i could relate to it and i knew how it was supposed to feel and just like when i lived in my apartment you know you have these big windows of all these blinds and it's still like a dark cave and it's moody and it and it kind of it really affects you emotionally i remember like being excited to leave it because it doesn't matter what what time of day it was it always felt kind of like a bummer mm. it never felt bright and airy but no it was a beautiful set that grace built and her set deck team did a killer job and they had everything from like medieval times cups to like old comic books to all of the great sports swag that danny's collected over his life like i could just spend an hour just like going through it. and when the actors came on set they were like beyond thrilled they were so excited i think they spent two to three hours just combing through all these little little hidden treasures it, um, it, it feels so authentic yeah for sure i think everybody who's lived in los angeles at one point who's lived in a <clears throat> an apartment in the valley they definitely know all of the the vertical blinds and the darkness and and everything else and even the just the whole structure of the complex and things but uh it felt super authentic and you do a lot of really cool little moves of danny brooding and then following and kind of like pivoting around and you're really setting up the drama and relationship between him and his brother. It's interesting because they're kind of like uh, two sides of the same coin. You kind of see like which way either one of them could have gone if they'd made different choices in their lives. I'm curious if there was a an intention 
distinction between trying to put them in certain light or shoot them in certain ways or trying to do something to try to show the sort of one upmanship or relationship between older and younger brother at all as you were going through this? There was a conversation about Paul and Danny and the, and the difference between their rooms was the main thing. Mm. There's not a lot of color in their life. We didn't fight too much to do something specific between Danny and Paul. A lot of it was designing. We were just trying to figure out what felt real. You know, that's such a specific setup. Like Paul is this jacked Twitch gamer, which to the naked eye, you're like, oh, that doesn't make sense. But there are actually a lot of jacked Twitch guys out there. <laughs> and trying to define their characters in their rooms is more about the small details and trying to make it believable. So we opted not to push too hard visually for that. Uh, one other thing that I picked up uh, quite a bit, it's, it felt like to me, there's a lot of driving. There's a lot of uh, Danny driving in this. Feels like the camera is usually only in a couple of places. In the passenger seat right next to him, sort of looking at him in pretty close. And from the hood, pretty close on his face and his reaction. Like, was there a real intention to always try to stay in the cab, stay in the trucks, to get, try to you know, keep on him and his face as you're, you're moving through this? Yeah, I've, I've always loved the, the idea of being in a medium or medium close-up shot on an actor and feeling the world around them and then having the audience have to figure things out based on those clues, making them work a little bit harder. You definitely um, work a little. There yeah. Is an, yeah, I mean, there's an intention to it as well. You know, like the end of episode seven is a frontal on Danny because, or is it episode, sorry, episode eight. Mm. That's because that whole sequence of flashbacks were all frontals that we chose to, to, to linger on as opposed to Amy's flashbacks, which were a very different choice to trigger a flashback. She had her younger self constantly walking in the shot and then we'd cut. Whereas at Danny's, we were always frontal. And so that always worked for the car stuff. In general, I feel like we always just put the camera where the most interesting angle is to start the scene, which is usually the actor's face because they're always generally thinking, should I do something or should I not? And just sitting a three quarter on Steven is great. I mean, that's also just having actors like that too. They can, you can run a whole scene just on their face and it's potentially the best version of it. Okay. So I got to talk about episode nine. I think episode nine is my, is my, <laughs> is my favorite episode in the whole thing. And oh, good. I want to say it's like the show is not exactly restrained, but there is a certain amount of restraint. Like you could have gone so far with the show, but in episode nine, you get to go there. You get to kind of like, you get to have this and I don't want to give it away for anyone who hasn't seen it, but there's a scene towards the end and it is kind of like the culmination <laughs> of all of the sort of buildup that's been happening over the, these previous episodes. And I got to say that that sequence, this whole sequence, this, uh, you know, I want to choose my words carefully here. There's a, an invasion that's about to take place into someone's personal space. And you've got a lot of characters, a lot of moving parts. Break this down for me. How long did it take you to shoot this? And what, what was your idea? So tell, tell me about your ideas of this, because it's so much fun. And the space has got so much character and drama and the inside and outside. And it, it's like you've got I'm just, I'll let you take it away. I want to say it feels like almost the climax of the whole series to me. So tell me about it. Yes, yeah, it feels like it. I mean, we're talking about the interior sequence, right? Yes. Yeah, there's a chase scene inside of a billionaire's mansion, uh, which is actually a Jewish temple in Simi Valley. The exterior of it is actually the original from Power Rangers. It's mm. like Zordon's whatever cave or lair. I didn't realize this, but the interior is this beautiful temple that has one giant cylindric room. And inside of that is three varying sizes of other cylindric rooms. And the walls can move and close. And we had five days to shoot that episode is a better way to put it. Five days. I was going to say it, it looked like five days. Oh, my God. I mean, you've got throwing of chairs and uh, stunts. And then you've got a like a fog machine, a smoke machine of some sort, like major foggers. And you've got steady cam shots, I believe, running down hallways. It's this whole elaborate climax. And it's also super dramatically lit. So it's like, you know, really top down and just like, you know, lots of darkness everywhere. And You've got these people in masks. And anyway, I, I had so much fun. I thought for me, this was like, I, I couldn't believe what I was seeing. And it kind of like sets the whole conclusion of the show on its path. So it's it's this critical sequence. And, you know, there's all this drama. And then there is like the little, you know, outside night exterior sort of stuff, too, where with Danny and Paul and this goodbye sort of moment, it's it's incredible. Like, I, I will tell you, the first time the first night that I watched Beef, it was episode one. It was right before I went to bed and I had terrible dreams that night. There's something about like the, uh, the, the <laughs> lack of empathy, like in my dream, like no one had it in my dreams. No one had any empathy. And it was it was really like traumatic to me. I was like, wow, I enjoyed the show, but 
is this going to happen to me every time I, I watch the show? Am I going to have like this stuff like psychological imprint on me? And certainly not. But by the time we get to nine, it's just farcical enough that it's like it's slightly removed from reality. But at the same time, it is uh, so dramatic. And there's people who are like coming in and out of fog, coming in and out of like the smoke. Tell me a little bit about your visual breakdown going into none of the, the plot points. And I, I think we'll be we'll be fine here. I forget when we approached this, Jake, Jake called it dumb heat. Dumb he wanted heat. he was <laughs> dumb heat. He wanted this like very heat? strong and yes, but just d- a dumb version of it. You know, it's very abs- it's absurd. And so there was um, he didn't want to have a lot of excessive stuff. He's obviously we were all big fans of Michael Mann, so we tried to you know even though there is some there's a lot of absurdity happening with it, we tried to, to pretend that that wasn't there and heighten everything and try to really make it about. There's camera movement. It's moving with the character. It's not enhanced. It's not. It's not. It's not superficial. It has to. It has to be propelled by the action. And also trying to do dynamic whip pans and to do camera pushes with the actors. Um, and so as it builds, it's kind of relaxing. And then once once the guys show up, it starts becoming this kind of weird, funky place to be. And then they end up running in this hallway, which we just kind of had pools of light, and we were moving so fast, and we saw everywhere. We had to just kind of put in titans and make it and just call it a day. Mm. And the biggest swing that we took is the security alarm gets triggered and this fog fills the room. And then I was just, we had rigged Titans everywhere and other bounces. And I was just showing Jake some options on the dimmer board of like, well, do you want it just like, is it just flash red? Is it pulse red? And he was like, what's the worst version of this? And I was like, oh, it just does this kind of pulsing red that it feels like it's the end of the world. And he was like, let's do that version. <laughs> I feel like... And I was like, all right, man, it's <laughs> a big swing. And he's like, let's go. It's so um, worse, it was really It's fun. lovely. It's it's so great. <laughs> it's a great, it's a bold choice. I, I love it. It's it's so good. Uh, yeah. All right. So a lot of the show is subtle. A lot of the show doesn't swing for the fences. And I think that's exactly why episode nine stands out. But, you know, tell me a little bit about the restraint and shooting beef. The, the joy in beef is that you see these real people making everyday decisions that like a a pebble rolling down the hill or whatever, it starts to gain momentum and you start to appreciate these smaller pieces. And so Danny first, you know, this car rage incident and then him losing his job and then him slowly starting to like bring his life together and that, you know, he has this cathartic moment at church. And and basically in order to get there, to, to enjoy those moments, we had to make sure that the other moments didn't stand out or we weren't trying to make everything feel special. I had to feel feel mundane in a way. And so every episode was about trying to find these four or five little pieces that were great. So in episode three, when he sings Incubus and we're just slowly pushing in on him, that was always like, I mean, I could have pushed in for the whole track because Steven did such a good job and he performed it live, but it's those small moments. And every, every episode had a, something like that you would get excited about. Amy eating a burger at uh, Burger King at the end of episode seven, you know, or like him in Vegas and Amy, like, you know, wagging her finger in slow motion. Um, <laughs> as the offspring plays in the background is one of my favorite moments. Yes. Um, <laughs> those types of weird things. We also like, you know, we were really, we were strapped for time. We didn't have a lot of resources. So like pulling Vegas off in like a, you know, in a hotel that was just south of LA that literally had nothing from Vegas in it felt like a, another small victory trying to like make a place somewhere completely is not, you know, it's a subtle show. And I, and I think the work that we did is intentionally not trying to be showy. You know, we're not like a Western that's shooting a sunset every episode, like vying for cinematography love. It's like, it's a, we're trying to remove that aspect from it. <laughs> well, well um, despite being restrained and conservative and about the small things, the show has an element of being a little bit slick and a little bit glossy. This is like contained, restrained, but like, it looks like you had an unlimited budget. It looks incredible. So, uh, what did oh, that we did, did not. <laughs> well, no, I mean, we, we hustled a lot. I'm, I feel like I get hired because I'm very fast. Mm. <laughs> it's half the time I'm like, you're like, you're fast, right? And that, and when I say fast, it means like, I like things dark and moody and I'm not going to lie to it a lot. So yes, I can be fast. Yeah, I mean, we had five to six days an episode that's on pace of an indie film. You know, you're working at, you know, five pages, six pages a day. Yeah. You know, and a lot of it is depends on the actors being game and being able to just like knock it out and not be going to their trailers the whole time. And we had a great cast and they were just there and we powered on. And, you know, and by doing that, you got to really, really explore the performance. You know, if you have enough time, you get to evolve it and, you know, let the actors improvise or change it up or like, it doesn't feel right. Let's come back to it. Um, the slickness probably comes from Jake and Sonny both really, and Hikari both are really like moves that 
could do as much as possible in one shot. Mm. And I think that choreography is probably where you're feeling that, you know, we're not four cameras, handheld, long lensy, just seeing what happens wherever the actors go. There is an intention. And I think the other part of it is because there is a fair amount of mundane locations, I think we opted to make a look that was punchy. You know, I think Stoney had referenced initially, you know, like every person that loves it. I mean, Paul Thomas Anderson from like the 90s and aught. So like, you know, Punch Drunk Love was a big part of the look for it. Also, because we had a lot of white in the show and, and we wanted to really make things pop. In the end, we kind of created a lot that I is called Southern California, which is actually based off of the original Top Gun with like a really spicy highlight and then just real juicy skin tones, just like you want flesh. <laughs> Uh, you want you want that, but what what that ended up doing is okay. Wait a second, wait a second. Spicy flat. and juicy. I got to ask you to define <laughs> spicy and juicy because you know the, the, a lot of details. Spicy is like it's like a highlight. <laughs> <laughs> it's all bullshit, right? It's all, yeah, this it's is all, what I DPs mean, do, though. You, this, think, you go into the go grade. To... I mean, this is exactly it. This is this is the conversation that DPs have with colorists and DITs about what and directors about what it's going to be. And there are these adjectives. These adjectives are really important because they get across the theme and the feel but I, I mean i just don't know what spicy or juicy means to you so it could it could be it could be a bunch you're, of events, yeah. usually you there those words are created so that you, the colorist can have an opinion about mm. his work mm. mm-hmm. or their work yeah. um by saying something i i want it to clip or i want it to be brighter you're saying i want it to feel spicy and then they have to go fuck what does that mean and it's like <laughs> oh let's make it brighter and i'll add cayenne so i guess i'm gonna put red in the highlights um, you know, it's, uh, I honestly want to make a coffee table book of shit DP say in the grade because it's insane. But uh, no, the you know, why spicy? It meant we wanted a highlight that would snap, not clip, but that would just it just felt like you know it was explosive but not gone. And then juicy meant that I wanted like a range of color in the skin with ruddiness is usually what I what I mean by that. Mm. I want to feel red. And actually, that became a point of contention in the grade. And that, uh, Sonny, it was like, there's too much red in their faces. And I was like, I love it. It's great. You can actually see the range. And he was like, no, there's too much red. Dial it back. And I was like, okay, fine. Uh, um, yeah. Same thing. And initially, I had done a grittier version of the of the grain inhalation pass, which they, I think they dialed. They dial, like everything. It's dialed back like the last day before. But that's where, yeah, no, the, I think that what we ended up also doing, too, is did an overexposure a lot in the grade which recreates the effect of when you overexpose, you print it down. And by doing that, you get snappier highlights and much cleaner blacks. In Mm. fact, if you ever shot film, a lot of the bigger movies are famously overexposed by a stop to half a stop and then printed down to give you that commercial look. And so we kind of, I don't know, I think, again, I opted to go in that direction because I didn't want to do like a low-con muddy version of this show. I also wanted the idea that when we do dark scenes that they were dark, dark. Like it wasn't just like mud, um, even though I like to live in the mud. I just wanted to do something different. I think every show I do, there's always a different choice. I never repeat myself. So this was a fun show to take those swings because it's a, it's funny to have like this big crazy look in like a a very small Korean church or to like take it to a construction site or Danny's apartment. It's funny to have that type of grade in those environments, and I think it made it more fun for us to shoot in a way that way. I think that's a wonderful place to leave it. I think that this show is incredible. I think a lot of people are going to get a big kick out of it. And I already see it on short lists for uh, Emmy nominations. So I, I expect that. Uh, oh, cool. I, I expect that certainly, you know, the cast, uh, Stephen and Ali show incredible range in this and doing amazing performances. Uh, the look of the show is gorgeous. The production design is fantastic. I hope that it gets all kinds of accolades. It is. Uh, it's so deserving. It's it's a lot of fun. And if you have haven't seen beef of course you can watch it right now on netflix so anyone within the sound of my voice if you haven't seen this it is it is so much fun larkin thank you so much for being on the show real quick before i let you go is there a place online that you exist do you instagram or stuff like that is there a place you'd like to shout out where people could could find you if you if they want to track you down yeah i mean my just larkinsciple.com is my website and my, my instagram handle is larks with three s's l-a-r-k-s-s-s um, just because that was the only name available, apparently. <laughs> Larkin Seipel, thanks so much for being on the show. I, I can't wait to see what you do next. Yeah, thanks for having me. All right, so that was Larkin Seipel. Larkin, that was so much fun. I'm so glad uh, that you got to come on and we got to chat all about beef. 
boy, that's a great show. I really had a lot of fun. It, it, it really is a great show. And Larkin's just, he's freaking visionary. And uh, I'm still, I'm still sore that he wasn't even nominated for everything everywhere all at once. You know, he was nominated for an Emmy and he did shoot the best picture winner. So that's, yeah. that, that, that's incredible. So I'm sure he's, uh, he's at peace with it, but on his behalf, I'm still annoyed. That... <laughs> the moral outrage. I get, I get it. I get it. it yeah. It, yeah. yeah. I, I totally understand. Well, I can't wait to see what he does next. Him, I, I think that him there's not getting nominated for best cinematography for everything everywhere all at once is the final cut pro 10 of nominations <laughs> I, I i know how much yeah i know how much that the final cut pro 10 bothers you so i i understand i i understand mm. yeah so well uh well we'll be rooting for him for his next project so that's that's you know that's going to be exciting and now short ends all right, so Ben, it is our short end time of the show. It's a time when we talk about, you know, what our pet obsession is, what we're really into, what we're following. You got something this week? Is there something that you're uh, you're interested in? Uh, I have kind of a cranky old man thing. Ooh, a cranky old man. Get off of my lawn. I'm ready. Dive in. Yeah. So uh, as I mentioned, we took my son to see Elemental. He was very excited, by the way. It might be the first time in his five year life that he uh, that he was like really pushing us like when does it come out when does it come out like he was really excited to see this movie we knew that we were going to go see it this past Sunday and he was his mind was blown on Friday when I told him it was already out that it had come out that day and then he wanted to see it again after we saw it and so Monday was Juneteenth so everyone was off of everything and it was like huh let's go see it and and uh, you're making wife, a little cinephile twice in one weekend look at that that's, he, that's incredible he, he in did the, the theater same, Oh. He did the same thing with uh, Nightmare Before Christmas last year. So, oh. so, and he loves to go watch movies in the theater and he sits there and now and, you know, he doesn't really talk very much and he's better behaved. I'm not going to say, you know, model citizen, but perfectly behaved. Uh, yeah. For a, for a five year old, he's doing okay. Uh, so we went to see it at a Regal Theater in 3D, but actually it was 4DX. Ooh, there's an extra D in there. There's an extra D and that dimension is kicking you in the back. Um, oh no! Uh, yeah. So when you go to a 4D X movie, um, it shakes the seat a little bit, little vibration. Not a little. No, no, no. This isn't like William Castle, the Tingler vibration. This is like you're on a theme park ride being violently thrown about, and it also they also have like air jets behind behind your head. They also have water jets in front of your face. You can turn the water jets off, by the way. There's like an on off switch for the water jets. And Elemental is a movie that is. Full of a water. Lot of water. Yes. There are <laughs> there are several characters who are water. So. so is it like nonstop air and water and shaking about? And and what did your five year old think of all this? Oh, he was having a blast with it. For me, uh, my <laughs> wife Alicia uh, kind of made fun of me for this, but I was like, I don't get the point of view of what's going on with with the seats. And is it sometimes it's the point of view of the camera. Sometimes it's something like a character gets thrown on the ground. And so even though the camera's static, you get jostled about. And I feel like it doesn't have a consistent philosophy as to when your seat moves. And when it moves, it moves violently. Like I, I love that your big problem is not the fact that your seat is moving. It's that whoever was responsible for programming that seat didn't have a philosophy <laughs> going into this. They didn't like have clear instructions. It was clearly like an intern at yeah. four o'clock in the afternoon on like a holiday weekend. And he was like, yeah, whatever. It kind of goes here. It kind of goes there. It's a kid's movie. No one's going to, it's only kids sitting in these seats. No, it was a 50 year old man who was sitting there. who was getting pissed off that you didn't <laughs> have a, didn't have a philosophy going into your well, XD I, I super just seats. Feel like I don't know who has to sit there and program when and how all the all the stuff moves. I assume it's got to be someone who thinks about that a lot. I would be really interested to know who watches the movie and goes, "Okay, well now we're going to shake you super violently." And when I say violently, it's like uh, if you've ever been in a movie theater where you have like a 12 year old kid kicking you in the back the entire movie, that is the lightest version of what was going on. It, it was like so. You if know, you had a martini, you're saying that it would be on the people. Next to you, on either side, in front of you, behind you, that martini is going to be empty. You're just like that. 100%. <laughs> and the whole point of this is to make the experience more immersive. Mm. But for me, every time the seat suddenly shook like crazy, it reminded me that I was sitting in a theater and it mm. kind of pulled me out of the movie. I actually think the 3D on Elemental is phenomenal, phenomenal 3D. You know, Pixar doesn't do anything in half measures. All their stuff is top notch. It's the best version of whatever it is. And so the 3D was great, 
but being like thrown around like a rag doll in these seats, it made the experience less immersive for me. Hey, if someone who is, uh, is in the 4DX business wants to come on here and talk to us about it, I'd love to hear what they have to say. I'm not saying that it's a fundamentally bad thing, but it's like um, when you go see a Shakespeare play, you know, like the first 10 minutes are just your ear getting used to sitting there and watching Shakespeare and kind of relearning how to hear Shakespeare. And I felt like after 10 minutes in, I'm not going to notice this anymore and it's going to immerse me in the movie. And it never did. Every time my seat was violently thrown around, I was like, oh, yeah, that's right. I'm sitting in a theater. Oh, yeah, I can't drink my drink now because it's going to get thrown. Uh, I want the the Shakespeare Festival uh, 4D version. I want the, you know. 4D Shakespeare. Oh. Yeah. Every time someone has a doth or a thou and if the seat could shake violently, if I could get some thump in the rump from uh, from the, uh, the but 4D Shakespeare. Shakespeare. I, like I'm, yeah. I'm going Titus Andronicus. Oh, I was uh, thinking Othello, but, you know, whatever. You know. Othello would be great, too. Yeah. Uh, Richard III would be great. Uh, sure. Mac Macbeth, Mac Macbeth, of Macbeth. course. Yeah. Uh, definitely not Timon of Athens. Super boring. <laughs> I, mm. We were joking about movies that, you know, for the 4DX experience, like, you know, Sex, Lies and Videotape or uh, <laughs> Mike, Mike Lee's Secrets and Lies. You know, when, when someone starts crying, it just starts, your seat starts quivering quickly back and forth. sprayed in the face with I that water. It just never, get, never gets literally old. Literally, like any 90s character piece, anything that played at Sundance in the 80s or 90s would be great in 4DX. Hey, Ben, can, can you and I agree right now? That the 4D experience is really just like, you know, the 2020s version of smell vision that this is just another gimmick. It's a one more gimmick to separate you from your money to go to the movies to possibly you oh, know, yeah. experience a movie like never before. Like uh, there was a, a version of Avatar that was released. I don't know if you saw this with like the movie projected on the screen in front of you and then also on the walls at the same time. So like, like, like Look, two man, extra I'm, I'm, screens. All for, I'm all for people experimenting in ways to make the theatrical experience more exciting. And, you know, it's because of that, that we have widescreen, mm. you know, and, and formats like Cinerama, Vista Vision, you know, th there are a bunch of different formats that were invented to make theatrical more exciting. smell of vision uh, smell of vision was smell invented. To, to yeah, no, no. Well, and I feel like smell of vision which was, that was John Waters, right? Who, who, who I, I, I know that the was, polyester was, that? was released with like a scratch and sniff scratch card. And sniff. Exactly. But like, go right back to, there's a great book called Step Right Up, I'm Going to Scare the Pants Off America by William Castle. And William mm. Castle in the 1950s was doing things like the House on Haunted Hill, where he would have electrified skeletons fly over the audience. Or in the Tingler, where he would have a buzzer under seats and he would make the whole, he would goose the whole audience. And I think that like, it, I agree, it, it's a gimmick. I mean, 4D is, you know, like, the William Castle version of it is probably not cheap by the day's standards, but not like 40X where you have to custom build a movie theater that just does this. You know. Was there a seat belt on your seat? Did you have to buckle up before this uh, experience? No, no, no. Di didn't have to do that. I mean, like, did you, and, did you think you're going to end up on the floor at some point? No, <laughs> it was mostly just irritating. Okay. Gotcha. Again, this me old man yells at cloud. I don't want to, I don't want people to walk away thinking like, Hey, I like 40 X. Hey, if you like 40 X, you know, drop me a line on Twitter, Instagram, whatever, and let us know. We'll read it on the air. I'm, I will do so uncritically. I'm not telling people not to like something. I'm just saying I had an annoying experience in 40 X and it's the first time I've ever done it. And I cannot imagine going to see a movie like Top Gun Maverick or, you know, the new Indiana Jones movie or something in 40X, anything where I want to watch the movie and not think about how I'm sitting in a chair that might throw me out of it at any moment. I didn't find it immersive. But if you do find it immersive, drop us a line. I'm not here to, like, jump in anyone's shit about it. Anyway, I think we've talked about 40X enough. Uh, Ilya, what is your pet obsession of the week? <sighs> well, sort of a surprise for me a year ago was a television series called The Bear. And, oh, yeah, it's uh, a great show. It was really, really great. And I didn't think from, I don't know, the trailers or whatever it was, it just seemed like this was not going to be a show for me. And I gave it a try. And holy crap, was I wrong. So I really found myself enjoying The Bear. The Bear season two will be out the same day this episode drops. So nice. like I'm going to be snuggling up to FX or whatever streaming service I can I can Hulu. see the bear it's on, on. It's on Hulu. Perfect. Then I am going to be hotly anticipating uh, popping popcorn and sitting down to watch the bear season two. I felt like it was such a surprise and so. Man. so I found, the, I found the bear to be so stressful to watch. Like it's, it's, stressful. it's brilliantly done. 
every performance is great. I love the way it's shot. I love the way it's directed. But I used to like when I was in college and stuff, I worked in restaurants and it, and it was like bringing back the anxiety of being a waiter. I still I haven't worked in a restaurant in so long. I'm not going to say when I actually you already kind of dropped my age on here. It's been since the mid 90s since I've worked in a restaurant and I still to this day have anxiety dreams about working in restaurants. Well, I am really looking forward to this. I have purposely not watched the trailer. I do not want to see the trailer for The Bear Season 2. I want to go in as blank and as empty as possible. I want to just mm. completely have the full Bear Season 2 experience as much as I can uh, Season 1, which I didn't expect, didn't think I was going to be into. And then I was like, what's the show? A couple of people I heard was like, oh, yeah, you know, it's, it's kind of this thing. Maybe, maybe. And then I watched the first episode and was like, yeah, I'm not really sure. But I stuck with it. And holy crap, it was like one of those really surprising sort of hidden gems. And, uh, you know, my hat's off to FX. FX keeps coming up with really good programming. I and agree. this is this is uh, just another example of it. So uh, kudos to FX. And you know where I'll be this week. Uh, I'll be in front of my TV watching The Bear season two. Awesome. Yeah. So, Ben, I think that just about does it for our show this week. Where can people find you? They want to track you down. Uh, I mentioned earlier, but you can find me at benrock.com. That's uh, everything you ever wanted to know about me is probably there. And you can find all my social media stuff. You can uh, check out my reel. Where can people find you? I do some of the social media stuff, so you can certainly find me there. There's not too many Ilya Friedmans in the in the world, so at Ilya Friedman on Instagram. Still don't really do Twitter, even though there's an account, but, uh, you know, the, the usual sort of stuff. LinkedIn, a couple of people reaching out to me recently from LinkedIn, but uh, most of my time is spent at Hot Rod Cameras. HotRodCameras.com is the main website where you can go to shop for all kinds of camera equipment and things. Ben, let's thank some people. Who do we have to thank for making this show possible? Oh, we have to thank, uh, first and foremost, Alana Cody, who's really just doing an amazing job. We have, uh, uh, including this interview, we have we have some really cool ones coming up that'll be dropping in the next few weeks. Thanks, Alana. Uh, let's also thank Ben Katz, our intrepid editor, who does his best to make us not sound like dopes. Thanks, Ben. And uh, really makes those interviews sing. So thank you, Ben. And last but not least, Kay Zalatrakshi, who composed every scrap of music that you've heard on this podcast. You can find him at musicbykays.com. Kay's also an extraordinarily talented director, visual effects artist, and colorist. Holy crap. He's amazing. I always look forward to whenever he, he drops some sort of hint about the next thing. I can't wait to see the thing that he directed. I haven't seen that. So that's, oh, you haven't seen it yet? It's really good. No, I know. I'm excited. Uh, all right. Well, Ben, I think that's just about going to do us. Do you want to take us out? Thanks for listening. This has been the Cinematography Podcast, presented by Hot Rod Cameras. Find your next camera, lens, or accessory on the web at hotrodcameras.com. Don't forget to subscribe to our show on iTunes and connect with us on Facebook and Twitter. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.